Come on. Here we go. I tell you what, give him a little hand of encouragement tonight, Mike. We're glad you he's taken off back to uh, Festus. He, he, he lives in the town where Festus is from, right? That's right. He's, Festus comes from your town. There you go. They, no, no, go ahead. All right, here we go. They actually named uh, the town we live in from the Festus of the Bible. In, in uh, the late 1800s, there was the town of Crystal City, Missouri, which is where Pittsburgh Plate Glass had probably the largest glass factory in the world, right alongside the Mississippi River there, and they named that town Crystal City. And it was a, it was a company town, so the company made the rules for the town, and almost everybody that lived in Crystal City worked at the factory. And the, co and the company had rules. They didn't like people coming in to work drunk or hungover. So inside the city limits of Crystal City, you could not buy any alcohol. You could not go into a tavern. There were no taverns or anything like that. So if you wanted to go and tie one on, you had to go outside of Crystal City. And as that uh, part of town grew and it had a bunch of uh, bars and everything like that, and saloons and public houses and everything, when people came to go back home so they could get up early and go to work, they come back. They, they said they come back Tanglefoot and back home. So they named the area outside of Crystal City Tanglefoot because of the way the drunkards came walking back. Well, those good Christians back in 1885, they wanted to incorporate all the growth that they had into its own town. And they said, we don't want the name Tanglefoot. That just leaves us, that's, that's unchristian, that's undecent. And so we're going to ask somebody, they had a big ceremony, and they asked some lady there, she had a Bible, King James, it's the only thing they had back then, and they said the, she's going to open it up. The first proper name that she finds that sounds reasonable to name, and thank God she didn't turn and read Mayor Shella Hashbaz. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, or Tiglath Pileser or anything like that. So anyway, she opened up to the book of Acts. And it was the man, Festus, who's the one that told Paul, Thou dost almost persuade me to become a Christian. So they said, We liked it. We'll name the town Festus. And if you think about it, the word Festus means party, like festival, festivities. Same thing, amen. All right. Take your Bible, if you would, Psalm 32. I've got, I shouldn't have wasted all my real estate telling jokes. Um, Psalm 32. Uh, pray, continue to pray for our ministry. Uh, the economy, bad economy is not just an American thing. It's around the world. Um, we fed 3,000 families this month. Um, we're not sure if we're going to be able to feed in the month of June. So I'm just, I'm asking you to pray. I'm not asking you to do anything else. I'm asking you to pray. Uh, but in Turkana, uh, Kenya, there is a big, huge need for food. What used to cost us, if we were going to feed about 3,000 families, it would cost us $4,000. That, And just in a couple years, since the Biden administration and everything else that's going on, it now costs us $9,000. Yeah, that is a more than 100% increase. And so it's getting, it's getting tough out there. And so I'm, at, I'm asking you to have a heart for God's people. And they are God's people. I love them. And I love fellowshipping with them. I love preaching with them and to them and teaching them. And, and just sharing the things that they share with me. And what a blessing it is. So please pray for uh, the ministry that God has given us. Not only there, but around the world. Psalm 32, blessed is he whose transgression is what? Forgiven. Forgiven. Whose sin is what? Amen. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no guile. Do you believe the word of God? Say amen. There's four things here. and I've got to, got to move fast. There's four things here. Four represents the gospel. I mentioned that this morning. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when you look at uh, verses 1 and 2, you see the gospel here. When you are blessed, blessing is a salvation word. If you're blessed, it's be, God has saved you. You cannot curse what God has blessed. Amen? Amen? Amen. So if you're cursed, you're not saved. You're lost. You're going to hell. You need to be blessed. So blessed is a man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now, uh, I don't have a screen for you. Turn to Hebrews chapter 9. I wanted to do this real fast so we didn't... Didn't bother with time setting up the screen. And I'm just going to give you a lot of scriptures. So you turn fast, all right? 
I'll turn with you, even though I have it in my notes in front of me, I'll turn with you just to make it fair. Charge. Here we go. Hebrews 9, verses 19. The Bible says, So when Moses has spoken every precept to all the people, according to the law, he took the blood of calves. I'm going to preach on the blood very quickly. Took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. Look at verse 20. Saying, this is the blood of the testament. Isn't that amazing? Because that's what Jesus said. Yep. The Last Supper, this is the blood, this is the New Testament in my blood, this do in remembrance of me. Christ did not come to point us back to Moses and the law. Moses came to point us forward to Christ and a new law, amen, new covenant. Uh, verse 21, moreover, I always wanted a dog named moreover. You know, like in Luke 16, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, moreover, the dog came and licked his sores. This is my day job. Okay? Moreover, verse 21, Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Are you a vessel of God's ministry? Is God using you? Does, do you want God to use you? That's all I wanted all my life, even as a little boy before I ever remember going to church. I, oh, I just always believed in God. And I just always wanted God to use me somehow, some way. And I'm just so thankful that He chose to instead of choosing not to. He could have, but He, but he chose to. And then look at verse 22. And almost all things. You want to have fun? Underline that phrase, all things. Write it on a piece of paper somewhere. And when you get to a, a computer, download our software, purebiblesearch.com. Free software, you'll love it. Type in that phrase, all things, and chase it through the whole Bible. There's 220 verses. You're gonna, now, you're going to miss Matlock and whatever all, all the other shows you like to watch. You're going to miss that, but I promise you it'll be time well spent. Okay? Jesus, the Bible says, when Jesus knew that all things had been given into His hand. I can do what? All things. Listen to that now. That ought to spark it in your mind. Almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. Several years ago, uh, I received a letter, and uh, or no, it was in the form of an email, and a man that I knew that was part of my childhood there at Bethel, he was a pastor now, and he sent out some uh, some document to all the pastors on his email list, and it was something to do with the heresy surrounding the blood. When I looked at the document, I saw that it was written by uh, Pastor A.B. Brown. That was my first pastor when I uh, started going to Bethel back in 1975. And so I thought, okay, uh, Pastor Brown, he must be, there must be some heresy about the blood, and he's going to address that heresy. So I, like me, my mind just goes from here to there. I'll read it sometime. Uh, a little while later, we was at uh, the Oak Lane Church for their camp meeting, and, and uh, Brother Lonnie had us out at his cabin, and I started talking to Brother Mike Hutzel about that. I said, are we talking about that document? And he mentioned Pastor A.B. Brown and that document about the blood. And I said, what was that about? What I found out was this, past, this former pastor of mine has gotten so smart in Hebrew and Greek that he found out and decided that when you see the word blood in the New Testament, it doesn't mean blood. It just means death. It's a, it's a metonym, he called it, which is like a synonym. So when you see blood, you don't think blood, you think death. And then he said that the blood of Jesus was no more divine than his sweat, his spit, or any other bodily fluid. And I lost it. I come unglued. I was going to have that man come back and preach a 30th anniversary homecoming at our church, or 25th anniversary, and when I heard that, I went, nope, he's not stepping behind my pulpit. We're in a fight for the Bible. We're in a fight for the, the remission of sins by the blood of Jesus Christ without the shedding. See, it doesn't even make sense. Without the shedding of death, there's no remission of sin. Amen. 
Now, boy, I wish you could see these pretty pictures I have up on the screen. Luke chapter 22, verse 20. Likewise, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new testament in my blood, which is shed for you. So uh, I, I sat down back in 2017 and I and I was going to try to do a teaching on the blood for our homecoming. And I said, God, I don't know anything about blood. I don't know anything how it relates. I just feel like there's something important there. Would you show it to me? And I just was went about my business and a couple hours later, boom. God started showing me these things. I started looking it up, using the internet, looking up things that I didn't know about blood. And I got to the white blood cell. I talked about the red blood cell. You know, blood, uh, grapes come in red and what? White. There is red wine. There is white wine. And there are red blood cells and white blood cells. And I would read that passage where uh, the Bible talks about uh, their, their, their garments are dipped in the blood of Jesus and he's made them white as snow. And I'm going, you know, anytime I got blood on my shirt, it was red. Okay? How does the blood make something white? And I was forgetting about the white blood cells. They are called the soldiers of the body. The white blood cells go throughout the entire body. And watch this now. They're looking for something in you that's unclean. I mean, if you got something unclean, you don't have to raise your hand. I already know you do. But the job of the white blood cell is to take care of that thing that does not belong in your body. It does not belong in your system. It does not belong in your blood. It will kill you. It will poison you. It will destroy you if it wasn't for the white blood cells in your body. So, uh-oh, hang on here. I'm flipping the wrong way here. Uh, turn to, let me just read a couple of verses very quickly for you. Exodus chapter 30, verse 10. Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once in a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in the year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. In the Old Testament, they had to have blood and it was the blood that made things holy. Luke, Leviticus chapter 16, verse 18. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about and he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger. One, two, three, four, five. I don't have seven fingers. Six, seven times. Seven is the number for perfection and completion. And when he sprinkles it, he cleanses it. The sprinkling of the blood, the application of the blood cleanses that which is unclean and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. What God, what they didn't know, what they still don't know to this day, and you pray for Israel because the Savior's coming for them. Amen. You pray for them. What they didn't know then or what they don't know now was that one sacrifice has been made for all of the people of Israel. Amen. Amen. I did a deal earlier in the year for, uh, about the Catholic Church. I'll tell you what. Disgusting. Some of the most disgusting human beings I've ever encountered are in the Catholic Church. And their doctrine is so hellish. It denies the blood. It denies the one time sacrificial atonement of Jesus Christ. They say, we got to kill him all over again because you sinned. That makes. Ugh. Uh, turn to Hebrews 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13. Very quickly, I want to just read it while you turn in Hebrews 9, chapter 13, or verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an ever sprinkling, the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Not only does the, the blood of Christ uh, purges from our sins, it purges our conscience. Our conscience is our knowledge that we did something wrong. It's how you parents can know that your child is lying through his teeth to you. Did you do that? Uh, no, I didn't do it. You know why he's making those motions with his body? His conscience is wanting to say, yeah, I did it. 
Because his conscience, it means with, con means with, science means knowledge. With knowledge that I know I did it, but I don't want her to know I did it. So when my mom would ask me, son, what are you doing? And I knew that I didn't, I wasn't going to get in trouble for what I was doing or what I said I was doing. I was going to get in trouble for what she thought I was doing. Amen. So I need, mom, I need to know what you think I'm doing. Anyway. <laughs> My mom's probably listening. Um, but when it purges your conscience... Now, you still remember your sins, don't you? You were there when you did them, right? But now you have a new knowledge. And that new knowledge is, I know that I've sinned, but I also doub doubly know that my sins have been forgiven. In fact, if you go ask God right now where my sins are, what sins are you talking about? I don't remember them any. Amen? Now, let me tell you the role of the white blood cell. When I saw this, I did. I wept. I, man, I smiled. Do daddies went up and down my back. The job of the, the white blood cell is this. Let me read some more verses. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, His Son, cleanseth us, us from all sins. Amen. Amen. So, so, who remembers, remembers where's all of our students here, who remembers the phrase phagocytosis? Who's, who's ever heard of that phrase? phrase? Nobody, you have, you have, two people. Don't, don't y'all go to school, school here? <laughs> it's still science! Phagocytosis. It is the process by which the white blood cell eliminates that which is unclean from the body. Amen? So now, uh, let me get to it. The first part is called engulfment. Think about what that word means. It means that the white blood cell, when it finds an uncleanness or a bacteria or a virus or anything that does not belong there. You get dirt underneath your skin like on your face or your arms or whatever, that little bit of dirt and all of a sudden in a few days you've got white, you've got a big pimple there with white blood cells all in it. Those white blood cells have been dispatched to that dirt area in your body because it doesn't belong there and what it's doing is it is covering it completely. Woo. Psalm 32, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. That's, that, it covers it. It's covered. You may know somebody from your past that come in and say, well, you can play church all you want to, but I know what you did. You can say, you know what? It's covered. It's covered. And how about your sins? I'd like for your sins to be covered. Just put it back on them. Amen. Psalm 85, 2, Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. It is complete coverage. If one, if one white blood cell won't do it, they make a call out, blow a trumpet, blow a whistle. I don't know what they do. But all of a sudden, millions more white blood cells will come to the aid. In fact, as long as you have a healthy body, there is no limit as to how many white blood cells your body can produce to go and it doesn't matter how much the sin is doesn't matter how big the uncleanness is there is more than plenty white blood cells to cover it all amen amen covered all their sin not like the catholic church says well you got to pay for part of it so I, you know what bothers me about them they've turned prayer into a punishment Oh, you've sinned this sin, and I, I tell you what, I want you to, I want you to say 50 Hail Marys, and I want to say 100 Our Fathers. They have turned prayer into a punishment. Godless people. The second thing that white blood cell does, once it's covered it completely, it's not done. The second phase, first phase is called engulfment. Second phase is called degradation. Which means, it does what I do when I get a biscuit to put gravy on. My mama told me, break it up first. Don't eat the whole thing all at once. 
break, break it, it up. And, and the white, white blood cells, cells now, now that they've covered it completely, completely they, they start, start tearing it to shreds. Psalm chapter 2, Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Psalm 72, 4, um, He shall save the children of the needy and shall break in pieces the oppressor. Psalm 74, 14, Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces. Psalm 89, 10, Thou hast broken Rahab in pieces as one that is slain. Amen. Break it in pieces. Tear it all up. Tear it to shreds. Amen. That's what God will do with your past. He'll rip it up. He'll take the sheet of your guiltiness. You know they've got a book on you in heaven. Every deed that you've done, every thought that you've thought, every idle word written down. But when it comes time for judgment, they take it, tear it up into a billion pieces. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Now, here's the third phase. The first part is what? Engulfment. Second one is degradation. Consumption. Numbers 32, 13, the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel and he made them wander in the wilderness 40 years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was consumed. God made sure the wilderness consumed all of the evil Israelites before they went into the promised land. Did he spare anybody? Not the, way, not the evil ones, only Joshua and Caleb and those that had been born in the wilderness. Uh, Psalm 1837, I have pursued my enemies, that's what white blood cells do, and overtaken them, neither did I turn again until they were consumed. Psalm 59, consume them in, the, in wrath, consume them that they may not be. Mm. When they look at my book in heaven, they will not see red. Though your sins be as, they shall be. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be. Turn to Revelation 1. Now, everybody's got their theory on Revelation. I'm not going to trample on anybody's doctrine. I'm just going to quote something for you. And then make you mad, all right? How did John describe Jesus when he saw him in there? If you look in Revelation 1, you look in verse 13, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girded about the paps with a golden girdle. Look at verse 14. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as wool. No. Did the priest not lay his hands upon the head of the sacrifice to confer the sins of Israel to his head? Did they not take the representation of our sins, which is the thorns, and they put them on Christ's head? And he bore our sins to his cross. And now when John sees him, he's not carrying our sins anymore. That's already been done. His head and his hair are white as snow, just like wool, in a perfect fulfillment of what Isaiah said, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Let's deal with consumption. Uh, did I already read some of them? Yes, I already read some of them. Psalm 71, 13, let them be confounded and consumed that are adversaries to my soul. Psalm 104, verse 35, let the sinners be consumed out of the earth. Second, turn to Second Thessalonians. Oh, since you're already in the New Testament. You know what revival sounds like? Amen. Second, I don't care if you use tabs or not. You can cheat all you want to. Just turn to the verse. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed. God is in the wicked revealing business. You, you lament over what our company, our country has turned into, but I tell you that God simply is revealing the wickedness of this nation. And he's, and he's getting darker and darker, but we're the light shining in the world. We shine brighter now. We're supposed to. 
as the day goes darker, they will see us brighter. Amen. Let us go forth with weeping. Let us go forth bearing that precious seed. Amen. Oh, 2 Thessalonians 2. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall... What's that word? With the spirit of his mouth. You know what the spirit of his mouth is? Listen, this is not just prophetic, it's practical. You know what God will do? For, you know what God has done for me? He's revealed wickedness in me. He'll do it every time. But He does that so that He can show it to me. And with the spirit of His mouth, He consumes it away. And He shall destroy with the brightness. What color is bright? Amen. Aren't you glad you know me? <laughs> you ready for this one? You know what happens to the white blood cell after it um, engulfs, degrades, and consumes? You know what happens to it? Who's been watching my videos? You come up here and finish this thing. Colossians 1.21, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man, in verse 14 it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death, through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. What the Bible is teaching you is that once God covers your sins, they are covered completely. Mormon doctrine allows you to repent for a sin one time. When you repent of that sin, you are promising that you will never recommit it again. Mormon doctrine then says that if you go back and sin that sin again, God unforgives the previous account and now He's holding two against you. Which sounds stupid anyway because all it takes is one for you to be condemned to hell. Amen? They're wrong on that. Other people have had that same doctrine. They call it repeated regeneration. Where you sin, now you're lost again. You must repent to get saved all over again. You get saved all over again. You repent, you're, and you sin, you're lost again. You need to repent to get saved back over again. That's not salvation. That's works, amen. Amen. Ah, listen, I think about giving you all of Revelation 7.14. Revelation 7.14, the, the crowd from, from all the nations surrounding the throne. And, uh, and the angel said, Who are these? And John said, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which come out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Not, not, listen, turn to, oh, you got to turn to Revelation 19. I've got to show you a fallacy in every modern translation. Except the King James. Revelation 19, you and I, because of Christ's righteousness, we're clothed upon with that righteousness. We do not have any righteousness. If we were had righteousness, it's filthy rags. We'd be wearing dirty clothes. Christ has adorned us by grace, not by works, not by money, not by power, not by position, not by race, not by anything other than His everlasting grace. Amen? And so, in Revelation 19, you have the marriage supper of the Lamb. In verse 8, it says, To her was granted that she should be... Notice it was granted to her. A gr I found out when I went to college that a grant is better than a loan. Because my wife found out after we got married that I had loans out. She wasn't happy about it. Amen. Grant's better because it's free money. Amen. It was granted to her that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Every modern translation of the English Bible says the righteous deeds or the righteous acts of the saints. There, it is. Their Bible is a different gospel just in that one verse. 
they are to be rejected. Revelation 19, the last verse, he was clothed with the vesture, dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. I'm going to ask you today, is your sins covered? Have they been destroyed? Have they been eliminated? Christ died so that you could be free from sin. Right where you are, bow your head, close your eyes. I know we've had different altar calls during the, throughout this day. It's been a wonderful day. When I get done, me and my wife are going to shoot over to the bus and head home. i got to preach tomorrow back in Festus. But I'm just going to ask you with every head bowed, every eye closed, you can come down here if you want to. But do you have sin in your life that is unforgiven? Listen, you, you are. I believe that you are a son of God, a child of God, Hebrews 12, and God does love you even though you've sinned. But I'm here to tell you, I had a godly mama, a praying mama, who did not spare the rod. She didn't have a rod. She always said, give me your belt. And she whooped me until I realized that the things that I had done were wrong and I never want to do them again. And if God loves you, he will chastise you. He will whip you, but he'll do it in love in order to bring about a change in your life. Do you have unrepented, unconfessed sins? And I know that if you come down, you're just telling the whole church and everybody here that you're a sinner. But you know what? You're sitting next to sinners. You're sitting behind sinners, in front of sinners. And there's a sinner standing here at the pulpit telling you, do you need to get right with God? Father in heaven, we come before you today and thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day. I thank you, God, for bringing me and my family down here. And Lord, letting us, uh, letting us share what Brother Kelly uh, is offering to his church and his people, Lord, uh, with, with our people all around the world. I pray, dear God, that people all over the world will be encouraged, blessed, uh, rejuvenated, invigorated, Father, to, and, and, and have zeal, Lord, to serve you more, to witness more, to pray more, to study more. And Father, as we are right now, coming before you with our hearts bowed, humbling ourselves before your thrice holiness, we come before you and we admit to you, Father, that which you already know so well, that we are sinners. God, we invite it. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin, your word says. Lord, you just left it impossible for us to get out of this life without sin. But yes, thank you, Jesus, for coming down, covering all of my sins with your precious, precious blood. My blood will not atone. The blood of bulls will not atone. Only Jesus Christ. Jesus, we thank you. We praise you this evening for what you've done for us in covering our sins. Father, help us, dear God, to live as Christ lived, without sin, as much as we can, Father. Help us, dear God, to walk that holy life, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, God bless you. Thank you very much.